yeah, Marcus, thanks thanks for for chatting and like kind of helping us build out and launch this idea around the human science club and, and like what is it is it is to be kind of human scientist and so uh, we like Phil and I both are enamored with the work that you've done and, and kind of the the path of leadership you've taken in terms of like both building communities on interesting new platforms like Clubhouse, which we should definitely dig into, as well as um, your own kind of work through cyborg anthropology and, and leading different companies and like how do we bring together technology and wisdom and uh, you know interfacing with people in, in new kinds of ways. So uh, I think one thing that we could do to kind of kick off is you know talk a bit about some of the projects that you're working on now, and then I'd love to kind of dig into a bit about you know your own story too and like how you got to where we are today. Uh, but this might be a kind of a good way to just kind of like what are you working on now? To help folks get a sense of of kind of where we're gonna where we're gonna dig into. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Adam. Um, it's really good to be here with you. Um, you know, with with every project, you know, I, I approach. I, I really try to ask myself what type of ancestor I want to be, um, and this has really served me well as a guiding light as I try to curate my energy around the projects in which I find myself grounded in. Um, so, in 2017, I was selected to be part of Singularity University. Uh, I was housed at NASA Ames Research Center in Mountain View for a few months. Um, the whole objective was to create a business that approached climate change. Uh, so through that, I took the first steps to create uh, a company called Urban Matrix One, uh, which focuses on creating climate solutions at the nexus of satellite technology, uh, unique data sets, and machine learning. Um, it seems like I was a bit early back in 2017, uh, but I stuck with the vision, and recently more individuals as well as companies are becoming uh, to see the value in utilizing remote sensing and data to approach missing data layers um, in order to make better decisions when it comes to capital and the built environment project. Projects. Um, a super exciting project which really activates my background in cyborg anthropology and overall arching passions and resonance uh, is with my business partner Ada Paris out of uh, London called ism.earth which is a venture uh, studio um, and Ada Paris is the originator of a concept called the, uh, and the identity uh, called cyborg shamanism uh, where cyborg serves as a provocation for people to think about what it means to be human and what we can be capable of and shamanism as a way to actively seek other ways of knowing um, and together cyborg shamanism is the landing to bring those different worlds together. Uh, we met through a mutual friend and connection from Singularity University early uh, 2020 and have been working with uh, our heads down ever since to create some amazing frameworks and design projects focused at the nexus of ancient wisdom, modern technology and future societies. Uh, under the ism.earth um, banner. Um, and then, you know, we've started unfolding our offerings through holding space on Clubhouse, uh, where we're bringing transdisciplinary intelligence and perspectives together to create the containers and conditions uh, to explore the intersectionality uh, and meaning of language uh, and how we can tease out the nuances that form understanding uh, in light of dissolving the myth of the ego and really creating a new pathway to self-actualization for individuals, uh, corporations, as well as institutions. And that, that's awesome. That, that's like a, okay, that's a ton of really, really cool stuff. Um, <laughs> you know, so uh, one thing that actually well, all of it caught me, but I, I want to I wanna actually like dig into this this point you just mentioned about um, you know, taking kind of a transdisciplinary approach in your work. And, and I think, you know, some of the obviously massive global challenges that we're facing, climate change is, is a clear example, right, that really require us to work across boundaries and disciplines, right? We can't just have economists trying to solve the problem. We can't just have biologists, but it's going to take concerted efforts across these things. And even uh, to the idea of, of like, how do we even see what's happening on the earth? Like the idea of remote sensing is super interesting too, you know? Um, so, I want to put these kind of ideas in play with this 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 notion you mentioned about like how do we how do we get intersectional in a way that also dissolves the ego. That's that's a, quite an interesting and a provocative way of of thinking about you know technology and solving bigger problems. So I'd love to hear you kind of just mull on this idea a little bit. Like how do how do we bring these different disciplines together in a way that helps dissolve the ego? Yeah, you know, I I, I guess it's really looking at. Um, a couple of angles. One is language, right? How do we actually come to an agreement on what words actually mean, right? <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> so um, that's probably a heavy lift in its own. But, you know, even like through the uh, conversations that we hold and the circles that we hold, uh, we want to get these transdisciplinary actors that are coming from different perspectives, you know, different locations, different backgrounds, different cultures, different experiences, different references in one room to actually discuss one word. And we actually have an alphabet in the ism.earth uh, mm -hmm. proprietary kind of, you know, back end where we work uh, on uh, different types of meaning and understandings of meaning. So, for example, anthropomorphism was our A letter. You know, balance was our second letter. How do we find this quantum in a quantum world? How do we actually balance everybody's reality, right? Um, and then C was curiosity. Um, and then just last week was diversity. And you would be amazed of how many different people have different understandings of what these words actually mean. So getting in a group of, you know, multiply, uh, multiple disciplines and having them actually just have a conversation around um, what these terminologies actually mean could actually unfold and create new pathways when it comes to, um, um, you know, creation. And um, I think, you know, even just through our last conversation around diversity, you know, there's proven facts that if you have these different types of understanding uh, in the room, then you can start to agree on new pathways and come up with new value statements and ultimately uh, come up with new uh, hypothesis for change. Right. And then how do you actually grow that and then test it and then ground it uh, where you can actually mobilize that through uh, a real life scenario? I think that that's super important. And it's what's interesting too is just just even this idea, right? That that uh, you're 100 percent right too. That that you know, we we think we all have an idea of what what a word means, but then we actually dig into it, and it's like, you know, everybody's got a different little take on the, on it, you know. And but then like when we when, when we realize that it's 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 this kind of this. I like to think about it like a fishbowl, right? When if we're a fish in a fishbowl, the last thing we're going to see is the water, right? <laughs> and we all think we know what it is, right? But then you get sometimes though. But even if you take the fish out of the water. They don't even know why they just don't feel good right? <laughs> right and so it's like it's kind of when we hit the limits those borders of those ideas or words sometimes um are these really important moments to pay attention so that's what kind of what i'm hearing a bit about this this word work i, I want to think about it. i love the isms that earth too you know um you know, and I think there's something there around active listening too, right? Mm -hmm. I think sometimes we're so solution based that we forget to listen. And sometimes it's in the practice of listening that we start to unfold these new ways forward. So I think it's 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 both sides of the spectrum, right? It's actually offering something up of your perspective, but also listening to others' perspectives. And I think finding that balance in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, mm -hmm. I think that's that's I appreciate that idea too. And that that's super important because it's you know, we can get a little caught up, I think, in, in internet land of like, oh, I got to put my ideas out there. But then it's like really like so much of the best work comes from active listening. I think you're, you're totally right there. Indeed. Um, you know, I, I want to also dig in a bit about the, the question you opened up with. I'm, I'm super intrigued by it. You said, what kind of ancestor do I want to be? Mm -hmm. um, what a great question. What a great provocation. So uh, how did you come to kind of, you know, center yourself not even necessarily an ancestral thinking, we might call it that, but just like this idea of like, how do we think with ancestors in terms of how, how we want to be in the world? Yeah, I mean, I think it's an interesting provocation just due to the fact that, um, you know, a, a lot of my learning has been very relational, right? It's been very specific to where I've been, who I've been talking to, and ultimately so many different elements that create uh, the robustness of learning right this embodiment of learning and i think when you ask what type of ancestor you want to be you have to consider more things than just yourself right you have to actually consider generations to come um and i think when you start to think about that lens time starts to shift right where it's not just about you know however many years that i'm on this planet but you know what do i want to leave behind um what are the things that you know i can take with me which is probably you know very minute uh things um but um, you know, at, at the aspect of it, at the larger aspect of it, you know, what do I want to leave behind? How do I show up as a servant leader uh, to the people? And how do I utilize my energy in an efficacy uh, manner that makes sure that, you know, what I do leave behind has some impact? Um, and it also is leaning on a lot of the native and indigenous work that I do is where, you know, native uh, individuals and, and indigenous 
uh, communities, they think about seven generations, right? Some of them think about three ahead right now and three behind, and some of them think about seven, you know, in, in, in front. And I think, you know, through this aspect of knowing where we've been um, to find the patterns um, right now to see what tools we have right now to work with in order to create future societies, uh, that really kind of gets us to think about what type of ancestor do we want to be. At least for me, you know, that's something that I think about. Um, so my actions are a little bit more calculated. It's not just out of self-interest. It's really about what do I want to leave behind. Mm. Oh, I, I love that idea too. And that it's, it's refreshing, you know, I think in you know, t today's kind of society, it feels like it's always moving so fast, right? And then and like, we're like kind of told not to think, right? And so uh, this is a really wonderful kind of framework. You know, I think that, that I'm sitting here being like, okay, what kind of ancestor do I want to be, you know? Or, <laughs> <laughs> it's a great uh, question. Everybody should ask it. <laughs> yeah, I agree. That's our, that's our next talk is what about that, right? <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, and so I think part of that, I think is, you know, one of these, these provocations that, that also I think is super interesting is this notion of cyborgs, right? That you, that you kind of pull out too. And so there's, there's both like the, the blog podcast project that you work, that you've got cyborg anthropologist and, and, and cyborg ancestor. Um, and, and then you yourself are really kind of embraced and in, in are, are active as this, this, as a cyborg anthropologist, as it were. Right. So I'd love to kind of break down in, in your view and your experience and your work, like what is, what is a cyborg anthropologist? You know, what does that work look like for you? Sure, that, that's a great question. Um, you know, you know, cyborg anthropology um, is a field where I explore the interconnections between humans, living systems, and technology. Um, and I want to consider some framing for cyborg anthropology um, as I kind of unfold this um, and our human relationships towards technology, uh, just to give a little background on the interdisciplinary nature. Uh, so, a woman by the name of Donna Haraway wrote this, the first book uh, in 1984 called A Cyborg Man. Manifesto, uh, which was the first widely read academic text to explore the uh, philosophical uh, as well as the sociological ramifications of the cyborg. Um, and Dinah, Donna came up um, to use the notion of the cyborg as a way to describe how human lives uh, may become entangled with non-human entities as well as systems. Um, and she further describes cyborg anthropology as the study of how humans define humanness in relationship to machines, uh, as well as the study of science and technology uh, as activities that can shape and be shaped by culture. Uh, so this includes studying uh, the ways that all people, including those who are not scientific experts, talk about and conceptualize technology. Uh, to simplify this train of research, we can approach cyborg anthropology as the study of the interconnections between humans and technology, right? So as an example, we take the backdrop of quantum physics where Niels Bohr, uh, Erwin Schrodinger, and other giants of the early 20th century, physics found that tiny objects such as electrons can be in two states, um, at once and can behave as a particle one moment and as a wave as the next, depending on how an observer tries to measure it. Uh, but what these scientists didn't do was calculate themselves within the experiment. You know, they were the observer, but not the participant. Um, so with this, we fast forward to a few women and a man by the names of Karen Barad, Rosie Bredotti, Elizabeth Groves, Jan uh, Bennett, Vicki Kirby, as well as um, a gentleman by the name of Manuel Delanda. Uh, backed by the philosophies of feminine study, these minds really push forward a concept called new materialism, uh, whereby matter is seen as an active force, not only sculpted by, but also co-produced in conditioning and enabling social worlds, as well as expressions um, when it comes to human life and experience. So new materialism uh, deconstructs the concepts of dualism and boundaries right, that many humans have prescribed to in order to define their world. Uh, for example, if we take the interconnections between humans and technology, at first glance, we say we are separate or different from little devices we so heavily covet, like our phones, our computers, um, and ultimately that serve as a connection to the larger world of information as well as access. Uh, but what if we put on the goggles of new materialism, we begin to break down these boundaries and begin to see that they are as connected to us, our definitions and our sentiments of human life, right? So to look at it a little more simplistically, as humans, we are rapidly creating technology, but at the same time, technology is also rapidly creating us, right? So in shorthand, there are no boundaries, but the ones we create 
And um, I think, you know, between anything and everything in this universe, we're dissolving those boundaries uh, to have a really a more robust understanding of our relationships to ourselves, uh, our planet and our communities. That's interesting. So, so it, it's like, uh, like one way of thinking about this or one way that you make me think about this is that the, on an, an important level, like the boundaries are just as much of a human creation as, as, as is the iPhone, but at the same time, all of these create us and we create them at the same time. It's kind of a simultaneous creation. Or I love the idea that we're both particles and waves at the same time. <laughs> I am the iPhone and the iPhone is me. <laughs> indeed, <more>. <laughs> indeed. <laughs> um, so like, what, what, I guess like the idea about these boundaries too, that we're kind of dissolving them, like what, what do these boundaries say about us? I mean, thinking about this anthropologically, you know, in uh, language too, right? Language is kind of how we demarcate boundaries sometimes, right? It says this is what this thing is. But even to your point before that, one word means a different thing to, to each people, right? So, or even each, each kind of person. So, um, yeah, I mean, how, how have th this concept of boundaries, how has that, that struck you? Like that we're dissolving them and that they're, they're as much as our creation as the technology itself. And, and indeed, you know, and I, I think it just even goes back to the primordial soup, right, where the algae and the fungi came together to create the lichen, right? They had to make an agreement. They had to make an association. <laughs> and they, the lichen they, fact. They, had to, they had to work it out, right? I'm going to give you a little bit of sugar. You know, you give me a little bit of cell structure and, and we're off to the races. All right. um, but, you know, through that, you know, relationship is really about finding and honing in these symbiotic relationships to the planet, right? Mm -hmm. So when we talk about technology, I, <clears throat> sometimes, I, you know, we think about just automatically these technological devices, right? But technology has been with us from the beginning of time, right? Fire is a technology. It's when it goes through the scientific processes, does it become an actual technology, right? So if we want to burn something down or if we want to keep warm, they're both the same element, but they're utilized in different ways, right? So when we look at the relationship that we have with the planet, it's really about understanding that symbiotic relationship. Um, and if we look at technology from a more uh, ecological standpoint, what better technology do we know of than the universe, right? And more mm. specifically, our planet, right? That's billions and billions of years of iteration in order to create the containers and the conditions for us to even have this experience. And it, it, the Earth actually grew us to be a part of that larger system. So having that symbiotic relationship is really the keys in order to understand that there are no boundaries and that we are a part of this larger network, this collective aspect of being uh, which would inform us and actually probably create better thriving ability, you know, sustainable livelihoods, regenerative capabilities, but also healing from a lot of past traumas that we may have inflicted on ourselves from our egos, right? And when I say the ego, I'm really talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know? So some of the work that Ada and I do really focuses on that where a lot of people don't even know the source of the actual hierarchy of needs. He actually stole that from the Blackfeet Nation um, from Montana, right? But he inverted it and instead of looking at the way they looked at it was we find our actual self-actualization through our relationship with our community, with ourselves and the planet. He put it as the I, I need food, I need shelter, I need these things. And that separates us from all of the magnificence that we are when it comes to our symbiotic relationship to our community, which is kinship to the planet, you know, and, and so forth and so on. So I think this aspect of dissolving those boundaries is really about dissolving the ego. Mm -hmm. I love that, and that's that's such a fascinating like that that and even the idea that Maslow, you know, lifted this the entire hierarchy of needs from the Black Feet Nation is actually such an important piece of actually how we consider, you know, the history of science and technology too, right? When we even think about how do we have concepts that that we think define our, our contemporary reality, to your point is that there's often, um, you know, much more complexity to that story, and that we often are not told, and so. It's very important, I think, in this case, to just point out and showing like how we interrogate our own pasts, right, and, and where ideas even come from, and, um, and even the words that we're using now, right. So, like, I got schooled the other other week, you know, about using the word stakeholder. You know, mm. to me, that sounds great, right? Stakeholder. We use this stakeholder, stakeholder, <laughs> but for a Native American, you know, stakeholders have a totally different uh, meaning mm. because, you know, during the Lewis and Clark days and, you know, when they were exploring the West, what they would do was actually put stakes in the ground and then the surveyor would say, hey, go pick up a stake and whatever stake you actually picked up was your land, right? Wow. So, th <laughs> so that's where the word stakeholder actually, you know, came from. So when we're talking about these words that we use on a day-to-day -day basis, we really have to be mindful of where these words have been, what their origins are, and how they can actually affect different people in different ways.
Yeah, that, that's uh, that, that's amazing. That, 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 that's such an important reminder too. Um, and we talked a little bit about this um, in, our, in our last uh, Clubhouse event, but you know, I did uh, my PhD research uh, working with indigenous scientists in Southern Peru on, on food production. Um, and then it's interesting because it's like, it's this mix of, you know, both ancestral and contemporary wisdom that like interfaces with scientific knowledge around, you know, genetics and biology. Um, but at the same time, it's interesting because some of the information and the wisdom and the knowledge is, is kind of the same across these different fields in terms of like how plants grow and in what, what varieties they will grow and in what conditions will make them grow um, or not do so well. And, and it's interesting to, again, think about the idea of how do we provide space for all these kinds of voices and all these kinds of, of different, um, I'm not going to say stakeholders, I guess I'll say players for now, right? <laughs> Participants. Um, there you go. You know, and, and how do we level that playing field? I think is one of the most important pieces too, because um, I mean, as we know that so often indigenous voices have been marginalized when it comes to, to scientific discoveries or obviously colonialism as by large, you know, but even that filters even to today where it's something that we have to often be cautious about is how do we provide space um, for multiple kinds of voices, right? And so we're in a really interesting moment in that more of society is asking that question, right? We're trying to figure out how to do that. Um, and so I'd love to kind of hear a bit about your, your process and your work there too, in terms of how are we intentionally building space for multiple kinds of voices and, and how does like the notion of the cyborg help us, you know, crack open that a little bit and say, let's provide a more, a more level playing field. Yeah, Dee, that, you know, that's such an important question. And thank you for asking that. You know, I think one is by generating those conversations, which we're really trying to do with ISM.Earth, as well as human science uh, clubs on Clubhouse, right? Mm -hmm. uh, really trying to have those robust conversations where we have these multiple perspectives to really get an understanding and almost creating a new ontology of understanding different words, vocabularies, language, things of that nature. Um, and I think it's a perfect place to do that because you can drop in. Of course, we're limited to, you know, some of the rooms being just English. Um, but also, you know, it's a good starting point, right, to have different people's backgrounds. Uh, but more specifically, you know, uh, my partner and I at Paris and a small curated group of creatives um, are creating a hyper-realistic immersive experience uh, to ask that question, right? What kind of ancestor do I want to be? And during this experience, we're really looking at taking uh, the participants from the I human to the we human. Uh, mm -hmm. So we submitted the first part of the trailer to the Buckminster Fuller Design Science Studio. Um, and in the first iteration, we began with a soundscape uh, that takes you through an experience from the I human to the we human. Um, and through this journey, we are approaching the dissolution of the ego, as we talked about in the metaverse, through setting those containers and conditions to leave old mindsets and programming, really breathe a new breath of a new orientation, um, grow in a newfound kinship to community and planet, really flow with the symbiotic relationship that we were speaking of to everyone and everything around us, and then ultimately grounding that and becoming a mycelian network of moving together to create a better future. Um, and I think as we find it, um, imperative that we learn from these indigenous knowledge. Uh, we have based the first part of the experience by leaning on the Kogi tribe, right? Where they would be put their youth in a cave for nine years in order for them to develop a deep understanding for themselves and almost as an orientation to become the shaman, right? Mm -hmm. And they would do this because in light deprivation, humans build up melanin. And when the sun is not allowed to activate that melanin, it builds up and then it releases in the brain to create this almost DMT or a near-death experience where they become closer to source or God or the universe. And I think this is why many of the ancient stories tell us of tales which uh, tell those on the journey to sit in the dark, right, until you become the light. Uh, and when they emerge from the cave, uh, they have a deep resonance and orientation towards the world. So during this hyper-realistic experience, the participants will provide a biometric feedback like voice, temperature, EEG data, eye movement, um, and a suite of others that blend these technologies into the human aspect. And then we'll also be um, <clears throat> creating multiple collective as well as individual art pieces that will be minted to the blockchain. So for example, there would be a piece in the experience where the participants will see their individual breath and will not be able to move forward into the next experience of the next sequence until their breaths are synchronized. And from there, that collective breath will be minted straight back to the blockchain. And there will be other moments where we'll mint specific artifacts, almost kind of like the golden record and on Voyager to really look at those artifacts of what we want to leave behind in this new age. Wow, that's super interesting. I mean, that's that's like, you know, 
NFTs off the chain, right? It's actually- <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. That's brandable, man. I see. <laughs> NFTs off the chain. I like yeah. that. <laughs> you heard it here live, folks. Where we got it. <laughs> yeah, you got it. <laughs> no, that that that's awesome too. And I, I love the idea too of just like doing doing mixed media work and like helping us really think through. You know, even yeah, how, how my breath becomes not like part of the blockchain is such an interesting way too, because like on one level we are decentralized beings, right? We are we are like both um, part of a system, but at the same time we're we're just we're like a, almost a chain of being too, right? So it's interesting to kind of think about how there's almost a ledger in ourselves of each of these things of breath and, and of conversation and of emotion that we impress upon each other, right? So it's like connected, yeah. We're, we're, we're the human blockchain, right? We yeah. are connected. You know, we are the distributed ledgers, you know, that are walking mm-hmm. through space and time. I mean, I think, you know, as we look at it like that, um, you know, all it, and I think that gets back to the anthropomorphism of these technologies is that a lot of the technologies are natural systems, right? We've just kind of put a different patina on them, maybe yeah. added a little bit more computational power, but that's from the same processing. And that's why I think it's important to go back and look at where we've been, um, you know, to understand that. And then and understand where we are now in this kind of context and then it'll allow us to understand where we can go and what are the potentials and then also where are our biases and blind spots um mm-hmm. where they've been in the past and how can we rectify those moving into the future mm-hmm. yeah i mean and speaking of that actually I, i'd love to kind of dig into it speaking of like uh, being her own past like i'd love to hear a bit about your own story too and and kind of what fueled your interest in this in this like incredible relationship and these projects that you're working on so um, I know you've got an incredible story, and so I'm excited for you to share it with, with folks too. So, tell us a bit about you know how did you get into to this entire work and, and a bit of your own story, um, in in that you just you know humans and tech became the thing. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I think it's also t- timing. So I think a lot of it is 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 temporal as well as spatial um, of when I was born. Um, you know, just kind of being born in the analog age and then kind of seeing this Uber rise to technology, Ladies, right? Um, <laughs> you know, just kind of being on that cusp where, you know, my first computer, you know, was bought. My dad had a Tandy 3000, you know, <laughs> we were, you know, having to go to Radio Shack to upload more RAM, you know, in order to make, <laughs> you know, Mode Runner work, you know. <laughs> but um, but I think, you know, even before that, you know, I would always see in shapes, colors, sounds, symbols. Um, and I almost had this, you know, that, well, I did have the synesthesia um, to a point where um, I was seeing things, but it wasn't really uh, mapping or art- I was, it was hard for me to articulate what I was seeing in this three-dimensional space, you know? So I was always either, you know, ahead, you know, like kind of seeing things and kind of understanding and feeling that things could actually work, but not really having the words to actually bring those concepts together and be like, I'd be like, you know, no, that makes sense. I I can't tell you why it makes sense, but it makes sense. You know, and I think as I got older, I really started to look at how do we use language as the coding material to actually have deep understanding for these things. Um, So, you know, through that journey, um, I really use my body first and foremost to really make that correlation. So through sports, it was really a good way for me to actually channel some of these larger visions, bring them down into my physiological aspect and use my physiological aspect as a almost as a parameter to kind of mm-hmm. be a guide or a litmus uh, checker on where I was going. Um, and I would use like different things like when I was meditating, I would listen to my heart and I would ask my, my, my questions. And if my heart were to beat fast, then I knew it wasn't something that I should explore at that time. But if I actually asked that same question and my heart was beating slow, then I knew that it was something that I could pursue. And I think as I started to hone in and more and more of, uh, of that, um, it opened up a plethora of opportunities for me. You know, it allowed me to understand what type of student, what type of athlete I wanted to be, uh, but also when I was out of alignment, right? We all know have this kind of general compass of when we're doing something that we shouldn't be doing. It just doesn't feel right. We can't understand exactly what it is. It just, te- you know, kind of li- listening and leaning into that instinct was really something that I did. So I uh, got a scholarship to UCLA, um, and uh, studied American literature as well as a minor in economics. Um, and I was always fascinated with uh, my first trip actually was to Lagos, Nigeria between my junior and senior year. And when I got off the plane, like I saw the largest sun that I had ever seen, like literally it was just this brown, like this, this 
ball of light that was just right over the uh, the horizon. And it, the smell was so familiar. I'd never been there before, but the smell was so familiar. Um, and then when we were driving to the hotel, you know, literally it looked like the infrastructure hadn't been touched in 40 years, right? It was mm -hmm. just, you know, buildings were falling down, roads were decrepit. But when I looked to the side, I saw two gentlemen dressed in slacks and, you know, button up shirts and they had the biggest smiles on their face. Right. And they were holding hands and they were just actually walking through life. And I was that that like flipped everything for me. Right. That there was something more about the connection that you have with other people um, and that connection that you have with your space. That's more important than the things that you can't take with you after you leave this this experience. Right. And I think so playing football and getting drafted to the NFL uh, to Green Bay. I always had this in the back of my mind that I wanted to actually be able to be service like they were. Right. How do I show up no matter what situation I'm in, whether I have 80,000 people cheering my name or if I'm in some small village in the DR Congo working for them and being in service to them. How do I find my happiness in that space? Right. And I think through that aspect of happiness, um, it led me, you know, to explore and to want to, um, be intellectually stimulated and to be curious um, about the things that, that were going on in the world. So um, instead of actually signing another contract after my fifth year in the league, I went and I traveled throughout Europe under the tutelage of a mentor of mine by the name of Dirk. Um, and through that aspect, I created the World Education Foundation, uh, went back to school, got my master's in a project in a uh, program in uh, Linköping University in Sweden um, in uh, adult learning and global change. And through the World Education Foundation, I was able to travel to about over 80 countries, work in 21 of those countries. And I began to recognize patterns in local communities, but also in humans in general. And what you find is, is that in any culture, you pretty much have similar personalities, desires, reactions, perspectives, abilities, uniquenesses. Um, and being able to identify these patterns really allowed me and trained me to be the anthropologist that I am now. Um, so, you know, I, I know I went the long way around and this a lot more nuance in that but you know that's kind of the general aspect of this curiosity um this thriving to solve challenges but also um you know what type of ancestor do i want to be really push me to think about these larger things i appreciate you sharing that, that that's that's fascinating um and there's something incredibly empowering about these moments there's both incredibly humbling and empowering right when you see a sunshine in two people that are just friends or just, just living life right that it makes you you know on one level, we get caught up because I mean, you can imagine the flip side. You're in New York City, you're Times Square. There's lights. There's there's technology right everywhere, and then but you're seeing everybody's looking down at their phone. No one's no one's kind of connecting with each other, or or they're taking a selfie, which you have to ask yourself how much are they really like you know connecting with the moment there versus like I want to show this to someone later. Um, not not to diss on on selfies, but just you know raising the, <laughs> this kind of question. Well, we will we, we will we will diss selfie sticks. Selfie sticks are a no no. <laughs> we can we yeah, selfie sticks are a no no. Um, I, I think that that. I agree there, yeah. Um, you know, but so so I'm gonna I'm gonna mold a question together with with we got we have some questions in the audience coming in too, so I'm gonna mold them together. Indeed. A little bit. And so um, so Bo is asking about the the idea of post human anthropology in the time of cyborgs, and we can break down what this means. Um, and this is an interesting idea, right? That that post humanism is kind of you know similar to what we're talking about. It's it's this the theory right that that's breaking this this idea between the human and the animal and the technological right, and that we actually have like to your point, these boundaries are kind of things that we artificially create in the first place. And so um, I want to I want to think about that idea and just sort of like how how does does post humanism at all? I mean, I get it's a term right, but this the idea that there's, these boundaries are are created by us. Um, how does that play into uh, this this other point that you made that I really I really appreciated about that. You traveled to over 80 countries and, and, you, and you're seeing patterns across the world of different communities and, pop, and personalities and emotions and like that's actually quite powerful to be able to see that like almost this meta perspective right of seeing so much so much space so how do you see these two kind of these pieces playing together seeing these patterns across cultures and peoples uh is as well as like this questioning our boundaries between animals and humans and tech itself yeah, I, I think patterns allow us to have meaningful insight, right? You know, and I think sometimes with the ego, we really want to get back to this as aspect of separating, you mm -hmm. know, but, you know, 99% of human biology is the same, mm 
right? And then our our the way that we approach and our perspectives of uh, the of our world and our experiences are quite similar. No matter where we go, it might be a different geolocation, might be a different culture, but you have the same type of actors in each of those scenarios, right? And mm -hmm. I think you know, looking at it, we gain a meaningful level to begin mapping the connections between humans and their environment, their community, the technologies and or economic structures which define the community or the individual as a whole. Um, and I think, you know, when you talk about um, pattern recognition, um, you know, it gets back to this systems type of thinking, right? This living systems as well as just systems thinking in general, that there are systems that can actually be translated into different forms of life. Like, for example, Fibonacci, you know, um, mm. you know, looking at those, the, the golden ratio and how it actually plays out in the natural world. I mean, if we look at storytelling, you know, everything that was actually created on this planet came from a story, right? It came from some type of written down or oratory aspect. You know, if you look at cave paintings right they were more than just like drawings on the wall they were actually embodied spatial type of engagement that allowed you to download information you know so mm -hmm. these concepts of where we've been ultimately are changed over time but they have the same concepts and i think if we can start understanding those patterns through that then we start to understand what the potential is for a future like so if we're moving into the metaverse and we're creating avatars and we're getting into this post-humanism where you know we're hooked up to these, you know, wetware and biometric feedbacks, mm. you know, loops and things of that nature when everything is integrated, we'll still be human, right? Because we'll still have and crave uh, um, uh, experiences. And then as soon as we're conscious of being something of whatever it is, it doesn't matter what you define it is, we are having an experience, right? Mm. And then that gets to the question, does anything that's living have an experience? I would say yes, you know, due to the fact that there's also tethered intelligence, right? That some maybe, you know, something mm. like a uh, um, uh, like a slimoid or, you know, or something that, you know, can, doesn't have any neurological pathways can get through a maze, you know, maybe they're tapping into something greater than themselves, you know, in order to actually navigate that task. And I think sometimes, or if you look at the murmuration of birds, right, how do they know individually where yeah. to go? You know, they're just, yeah. They're just working together in this symbiotic relationship. So when we start to recognize these patterns, then it actually opens up more pathways uh, to understanding uh, post-humanism, um, as well as the potentials of who we are as humans, but more importantly, where we're going to be uh, in the future. Hmm. No, that, that's, I think that's great, too. And, and even like these examples, too, and, and the idea of tethered intelligence, or even just thinking about you know, the rhizomatic nature of, of mushrooms in, in forests that can kind of seem to communicate by putting moss on different sides of trees if there's a forest fire to kind of almost alert their team or their, I mean, I don't know if the forest as a whole or individuals, right? That's the question, philosophically, but also perhaps biologically. Um, For sure. But these these forms of intelligence that are kind of moving across these different pieces. I mean, the um, internet has already been there, right? The digital <laughs> networks, the internet has been there, you know, yeah. and uh, and the world is the internet, right? I mean, if we look up at the sky during dusk and we see, you know, the burgundy, you know, huckleberry skies, that's just sands from the Sahara that have made it all the way over here mm -hmm. to actually give it that coloration. So everything is connected in some shape or form. Yeah. This is good. I like, I like this. <laughs> um, so we have an interesting question from Alexander here that that um, we'll break down a little bit, but it, it is it's kind of related to the question of algorithms. In in um, you've got me thinking about the, the the multimedia project that you and Ada are working on uh, in terms of the different kinds of whether collecting biofeedback or, or kind of you know putting people's experience into different kinds of ways of of, of you know digitizing them on one level, but then putting them onto the blockchain, for example. So. Um, so what, what I'm taking from, from Alexandra's question is around this idea that the like, algorithms, you know, they tend to run a lot of how businesses make choices around, um, you know, you know, serving you up data for one. I mean, Google will use an algorithm when you type a oh, search engine thing, it'll like, you know, crunch some numbers um, based on, you know, SEO on websites as well as on what you've looked at before and then try to give you what it thinks is the result that you want. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting about algorithms, um, Alexander points out, is that they're often kind of this black box that, that even the creators don't always know what they're doing or how mm -hmm. they work, yet we yet they are used to make decisions, um, sometimes like massive or decisions with massive implications. And so mm -hmm. um, the challenge that, that they mention is that these are kind of depersonalized from the people that make them on one level. Mm -hmm. uh, and so like mistakes are kind of seen as this abstract tools error 
you know, error rate, you know, versus kind of the tool maker enforcing biases in the tool, something that you mentioned a bit before, how do we recognize mm -hmm. our own biases? And so when they get written and replicated through algorithms can be have huge implications in terms of, you know, police racial biasing or that in general, like the first, and probably still there's challenges with um, the way that the first, you know, mobile cameras were made that they couldn't actually uh, take pictures of melanated skin well, that they, they just were calibrated because white people made them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so just even thinking about these and like they might call that an, an error rate, but at the same time, I think to Alexander's point, this is actually like the tool makers enforced bias, right? And how they're designing technology. So how do we think about this idea that like, do we, do we think that there's a way to use the concept of cyborgs to kind of bring accountability to these tool makers, right? To think about algorithm writers, I love this idea of thinking them as tool makers, right? And how do we highlight the importance of having diverse cultural perspectives um, from these makers in building these processes to kind of ensure accuracy across different kinds of tech? Man, you hit it right on the head. I love that question so much. Um, you know, and, and I think there's multiple benefits um, when we look at, and maybe maybe let me serve up a framing real quick um, to your question. You know, the, the world is really undergoing uh, a global evolution, which is integrating, as you mentioned, these developments in biology, materials, information technologies at an accelerating pace. Um, you know, so therefore the future and how humans relate to and intertwine with this technology and machines is being defined at this very moment. So during this transition, many fundamental as well as ethical questions are being asked, like how society should seek to shape evolution and governance around technological innovation? Um, what are the boundaries between human and machine, uh, if there are any, right? Will we need to be approached, processed, and researched? Um, you know, where companies as well as participants will need to know the ramifications around these uh, integrations and these decisions, who's actually building these things. Um, <clears throat> and we are integrating and assigning our agency to machines in the real world, as well as the metaverse, right? Uh, children are being on ramp at this very moment to learn, exchange and connect online. I mean, if you look at Roblox, I mean, people are actually being molded in order to actually start to understand what this metaverse actually means. Um, and as we navigate these spaces, is we should be mindful to explore that these important topics with the understanding that language, culture, and protocols will shape and define our culture, so social, uh, technological, as well as economic values. And I think that's where uh, we have to kind of understand that businesses um, are very solution-based at the moment, right? Mm -hmm. uh, rushing to create, to beat the market and competitors. Uh, but I can see a dramatic increase to hire anthropologists in particular who have been studying how to ask the right questions. Uh, while observing new phenomenon and really moderating discussions in a productive and intellectual way. Um, and I think academia uh, will be able to create research questions around these interconnections that will affect humans as well as the design of machines uh, in a real way. So for example, uh, I was reading some research out of MIT, uh, which was tracking first as second graders uh, going into school and found they didn't have the motor skills to hold a pencil or scissors mm -hmm. because they were so used to swiping digital devices, wow. right? So uh, in the same vein, if we look at educational technologies uh, to harness educational technologies for potential education decision makers, product developers and funders will continue to need to understand the ways in which technology can help or in some cases hurt student learning, right? So, I mean, those are just a few examples of how important this topic uh, will be in the future. And as we approach this liminal and integrative space, we will need more academia and research to observe, monitor, and create ontologies around these emerging concepts. Uh, one other thing uh, I'd like to add in light of this, and you brought up something about this indigenous wisdom and whose voices is actually heard, um, you know, and since it's such an important topic, um, <clears throat> During the last year or two, I've been leaning heavy on research and workshops led by a professor by the name of Jason Edward Lewis um, and a great team in Hawaii, uh, which conduct workshops and has generated a position paper called Indigenous Protocol and Arf Artificial Intelligence, uh, which develops new conceptual and practical approaches to integrating indigenous wisdom uh, in building the next generation of AI systems. Um, and so they approach questions like, what should our relationship with AI I B. Um, uh, especially from an indigenous perspective, um, how can indigenous epistemologies and ontologies contribute to the global conversation regarding society as well as AI? Um, how do we broaden discussions regarding the role of technology uh, in society beyond largely cultural homogenous research labs in Silicon Valley, you know, and startup culture? Um, and how do we imagine a future with AI that contributes to the flourishing of all humans and non-humans? So specifically to answer your question, 
and the academic prowess of a cyber anthropologist or an anthropologist in general can be equipped with identifying these patterns that we talked about, really creating this discourse, research, consulting, or becoming an entrepreneur in this fresh and burgeoning space. Um, and, you know, I like to think that we're now in an imagination age, you know, mm -hmm. and why not have some additional brilliance around some of these questions? Mm -hmm. I love this idea too that we can kind of be in 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 an imagination age right now is on one level I think a little bit of what we need in terms of adding a spark of hope to the work right and so it's not we're not necessarily just doomed to be controlled by algorithms but in fact we have the capacity to reimagine how our, our relationship with them too. Indeed. Um, this is super analog, but but um, <laughs> it reminds me of an example that I actually I just I heard about the other day that uh, I'm really excited about too. But it's it's a um, I'm a I'm a board game nerd. Uh, and, and so that there's actually this um, new sort of indigenous framed like sort of RPG board game role playing game called, called Coyote and Crow that is based. It's like an indigenous led and designed game that is actually trying to think beyond a normal colonialist mindset. Like, why do we always imagine, um, you know, games that we play even, right? Because games are, are one way of, of into, you know, imagination, right? Why are they always in this colonial mindset, right, of, of conquering a land, right? <laughs> Monopoly. So, yeah, Monopoly. Yeah, Monopoly is the, is the bar none, right? You know? <laughs> Um, but raising these ideas, this game is called uh, Coyote and Crow, but it's it's this is it's from uh, a Cherokee designer named Connor Alexander, and so it's just this idea too that we can take even even some of the traditional structures again, like how we think about a game, how we tell a story, um, how we design an algorithm to open these spaces. So I'm I'm actually really excited to hear about and want to do some digging around um, Jason Edward Lewis's work with, with thinking about indigenous protocols too, because like that is such an important question that we need to be asking ourselves, right? That we have the space to imagine other worlds. Um, and it's oftentimes we get caught up because we're now like with the wheels of spun. So now we're thinking, oh, how do we break out of it? And we can, on part by recognizing that there actually already are and always have been other perspectives, right, that are that are not opposed in the same way. Indeed. And I think that really leans on uh, the concept of storytelling, right? I think, you know, in the West, particularly like we've been so attached to this hero's journey, right? Yeah. Where it's a very masculine type of approach, you know, where we kind of have an idea, we have a superhero that we love, you know, they go through their trials and tribulations, they have their falls, but then they ultimately they rise yeah. and they conquer, right? Yeah. And I think that really leads into something interesting that me and uh, Ada are really approaching is this concept of what we call the ecological triptych, right? So making the relationship between uh, colonialism, uh, capitalism, and climate change, where mm -hmm. colonialism is almost serving as the ego, right? That our, that's our identity as this kind of divine right, that we are at the top of the food chain mm -hmm. and everything revolves around us. And then capitalism is like this, if we want to talk about computation, it's this reinforcement learning, right? So yes, degrade, yes, you know, pollute, yes, do these things, but you're getting rewarded for these things. So it's like, why would I not do these things, right? And then the results are climate change. So really being able to dissolve and understand those connections between colonialism, uh, capitalism, and climate change gives us a framing on what we need to work on the most, which is not necessarily build a new technology, right? It's really about upgrading ourselves as our operating system, upgrading that, and then maybe um, we would be able to approach some of these larger issues. Hmm. I, 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 okay, I'm, I'm, okay, my brain's like ecological triptych. Wow, this is super cool. Um, <laughs> we've got so many things to talk about after this. It's great. Um, okay. But I love this idea too, and just in terms of like we, we got to operate, you know, or we have to upgrade the human operating system too, and that's that's kind of part of it. And I think like to your to your point, if we change the reinforcement structures, uh, that then that obviously changes like the you know, was does that compute do this do this do that right? It can kind of like help change new pathways of behavior in in meaning right. And so, I think to come back to one of our, our you know original talking points too that, that you brought up is that you know language on one level is is a system of meaning right, and that we got to break that down and see where it's coming from, and so. If we're able to do that and learn to see that, then I mean, I think that this can apply all the way to algorithmic thinking too, right? That we can change the reinforcement structures that that say do this, not that, um, and and that I think comes with your point of like one telling bigger stories, having more voices in the in the story equation, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and having room for that. Um, and I want to ask, um, yeah, sorry, good. No, I was just saying that, you know, that's important. That's an important piece, you know, just having those different perspectives, as we talked about at the top of this uh, call, you know, just making sure that everybody's voice is heard. Sometimes it's hard to get everybody's voice, but at least make an attempt to include those those voices. And then if there is a change, you have enough room to actually make some course correction. You know, mm -hmm. don't solidify things, um, you know, in a way that just kind of solidify the biases because it turns into colonialism. 
you know, mm-hmm. and the tension, you know, like I think also move, removing the, the intention from it, you know, sometimes we lead with great intentions, but still has harmful outcomes. So being more critical in how we approach and having the protocols necessary to approach language, meaning, understanding, ontology, etymology, um, and then moving forward from that, that, that transcribe or that prescription, I think it'd be very helpful. Yeah, too, in terms of uh, just reminding ourselves, it's 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 important to be critical thinkers, right? <laughs> it is and not just accept like, hey, let me let me think about what who is this good for, right? Who who is promoting this idea? Like, what's what's gonna what's the outcome of this potentially? Indeed. Um, you know, as as speaking of storytelling, you know, um, we're close we're close to the the kind of the hour, so I want to be respectful of folks' times. Um, but one of the interesting stories that that you have been. Um, working through is is telling stories on Clubhouse, right? And Clubhouse has this this sort of new medium. Um, you know, it's it's called a social media platform to some. You know, it's interesting. I mean, so so you and I got to, uh, or I got to participate with you on on a, on a panel, which is super. We awesome. were together. We were together. We were together. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the other week, and we uh, you know this asked this interesting provo- this provocation around what is woke in the twenty first century, and that was interesting. Is is my introduction to to kind of uh, kind of working on Clubhouse, and so. I'd love to get your take a, a bit on on so Clubhouse is kind of a drop in audio format. It's it's live. It's not recorded. I mean, you, you could record them, but um, you know, it's interesting. I mean, me as a podcaster, this is fun because it's like a, it's a conversation that happens in the moment, and that's it. Versus recorded, and then we've got it, you know, kind of in perpetuity. Um, but there's something about the liveness and the intimacy of it. So I want to get your take on like what what about Clubhouse appeals to you, and you know. You you are are on a number of different channels and different networks within it, like they're exploring all these deep topics. And so how is how has it kind of worked for you as a medium for for kind of engaging this way? You know what? It's been groundbreaking, to be perfectly honest. And I think, you know, it gets back to that aspect of this collective intelligence. And it's really kind of served as a platform um, as that. You know, people use the tool in a lot of different ways, you know, but for me, I can just speak personally that I utilize it as a place of connection, um, a place to really bring people together with different um, perspectives. Um, and the funny thing is, I didn't actually have a mobile phone for eight years from 2011 to 2019. Congratulations. Uh, <laughs> so, so my digital footprint has been minimal but um you know even now i don't have a sim card in my phone um so a lot of my online presence is curated uh where there's wi-fi um mm-hmm. but i first heard a clubhouse from a friend back in may of 2020 um um when they were on ramping um but at the moment i really was consumed by you know the social and political woes of the time um and also didn't want to engage with my device more than using it as a camera and uploading photos some photos mm-hmm. to ig um but then my good friend from high school uh by the name of lady phoenix she invited me again in december uh after i did a podcast for her, a wonderful platform that she's running called universe contemporary um and as she's trailblazing and launching huge artists through clubhouse and really utilizing the platform to transfer her work from IG over to Clubhouse. Um, she's been launching some really major uh, artists there in the NFT space. And um, <clears throat> so that was kind of my first introduction to it. But then as I started floating around um, and going into some of these orientation uh, aspects like you come in, you have this, you know, little party hat that shows that you're new to the new to the tribe. Um, but then, you know, so people can lend a helping hand, show you around the hallway, which they call a hallway, which is basically a column of every, everything that is going on uh, in different rooms, all the different titles. Um, and then you have your friends where you can kind of see what they're listening to. So that's curated and then they ask you different interests. So it kind of gives a, a persona a portfolio of who you are. So within the our algorithm, um, um, tries to uh, recommend certain types of, um, you know, rooms towards you. But as I started on rapping, I saw that it was a powerful meeting to share stories, right? To get different perspectives um, and also to really hold space for listening. You know, when I first got there, I was in, you know, true anthropologist form. I was just observant, right? I was observing, you know, not only what the content was, but how people were utilizing the tool. Um, and I surfed through different rooms. You know, I read a lot of articles. Uh, that were out around, you know, the app. And I entered rooms that orientated newcomers, uh, as I mentioned. And I think through that process, I really started to see how I could actually utilize this tool. How could we utilize this tool? And then Ada and I started talking, as well as Phil, uh, Sir Les, um, uh, started talking about, you know, what are some of the best ways that we could approach this? And I think kind of looking at how different people moderated their rooms, you know, a value add that we thought we could have is just really being meticulous about the question 
questions that we wanted to ask, um, the profound statements on, on what actually needed to be talked about, and then also the unique uh, aspects of different people's personalities, geographical locations, uh, and references that could be blended in an app like that. So opening up rooms, you know, around having deep conversations about um, things like curiosity, things like diversity, you know, things like the future, things like technology. Um, I host a lot of rooms with MC Hammer, you know, and Dakai, who I would have never thought that, you know, me and Hammer would have so many interests. He was my hero growing up, right? Um, and, you know, especially when it came to performance and showing up. But now, you know, I get to see another side of him where he's a very deep thinker. He's a theologian, you know, he's a philosopher. Um, he's a man who's actually been ahead of the game in so many entrepreneurial aspects when it comes to technology and the way that he articulates and gives an al analogies uh, to where he's been uh, really kind of gives the power of storytelling. And so what we try to, you know, utilize the, the, the platform for is to really uh, hold the containers and the connection, connect, conditions um, to bring people together in a real way um, to explore, you know, multiple pathways forward. Um, and I think this is important, you know, on the app as well as off the app. Yeah, no, I, think, I think that's right on too. And, and it's it's one of those two, if we are to find ourselves, you know, on our, on our devices and, and on our phones, um, you know, it's, it's uh, I mean, one of the more powerful things I think we can do is to, is to find ways of, of connecting, you know, to be more human as it were, right? Even, even as we are more technological too, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the power of human voice, I think, is, is such a is such a key thing. And even the fact that I think I think something that's actually quite profound that you said too is that uh, a lot of the clubhouse work you focus on is around just having these deep conversations around things like curiosity, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm, I'm going to reflect back to the idea of of like, you know, anthropology as as a academic medium versus as a practice in the way of the world and how it can kind of be both of these things. And that. Um, I think pausing and having conversations like this, like questions around curiosity and conversations around, um, you know, what does it mean to be and what does it feel like to be human, right? Mm -hmm. I think are so important that on some on some level academically they can get dropped off and, and make, they get lost. Um, and then this is like a way to kind of tap into that almost, I think, and, and to sort of um, invite these conversations and invite folks that, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like Phil and I talked, I think we talked a little bit about this too, just in terms of when we think about human science and what it is to, uh, you know, open up uh, ourselves to these kinds of questions of what it means to be human and, and how do we sort of dedicate ourselves to understanding the human condition, but then to do it in a, in a multivocal way. Uh, you know, listening and storytelling are, are kind of how we do that, right? And so it's that, I think it's, it's fundamentally important to remember like that if we can, um, you know, get folks, I don't know, from, from MIT to, to join us too, right? And get Jason Edward Lewis to come on and maybe talk about the, you know, the, the indigenous protocol too. And then just like both have the academic conversation and the human conversation and show actually how those are quite aligned, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it's such an important piece. So, so I want to thank you for your work. I mean, you're doing such, such cool stuff. Hey, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. You know, and, and I encourage everybody just to kind of drop in. If you are on Clubhouse, you know, just come check us out. You know, um, I was in one room, you know, with Hammer and he was hosting this gentleman by the name of Dan Hicks. Um, and he was actually the, the, the author of this book called The Brutish the Brutish Museum. Um, and a couple of weeks later, I was reading articles of how museums were actually not either not showing their bronzes or actually having plans or creating plans to take their bronzes and give them back to, uh, you know, their indigenous uh, holders. Um, and so it's very actionable as well, right? So it's a story box, but it's also something that moves culture, right? And I think as anthropologists, we, we, we observe and we try to ask the right questions, but this is like an action activation piece on top of that, that we can actually ask the right questions, but then actually have impact and change in the real world. So, um, you know, thank you. It's been wonderful to, to, to talk to you. And um, I really look forward to our continued conversations. Yeah, cool. Many thanks. And um, I can't wait till the next Human Science Club event. And we'll Indeed. see you all on Clubhouse. Indeed. <laughs> cool. Thanks, everybody.